Telomere shortening is one of the hallmarks of aging. In addition, telomere shortening negatively impacts other hallmarks, including genomic instability, mitochondrial dysfunction, and stem cell exhaustion. More specifically, telomere length declines during aging in both men and women. On the y-axis, we've got LTL or leukocyte telomere length. So this is telomere length inside of white blood cells plotted against age. And this is from 20 to about 80 years old. And then for both men and women, we can see the age-related decline, such that in youth, average telomere length values are around 7.75 kilobases, whereas in centenarians or 100-year-olds, it's closer to an average of 5 kilobases. Now, a central premise of the channel is to slow aging by optimizing biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible, and telomere length is on the list. So I now have 16 tests for telomere length. So what's my data? How well am I resisting the age-related decline? And with the goal of moving it closer towards youthful values, which factors are significantly correlated with telomere length? So starting with what's my data, that's what we can see here. And these data are generated by True Diagnostic. If you want to measure your own telomere length, there's a discount link in the video's description. On the y-axis, we've got telomere length. But note that this is a DNA methylation-based estimation of telomere length, which may be a better measure than standard ways to measure telomere length, at least in terms of all-cause mortality risk. And if you're not familiar with that data, I'll link to the paper in the video's description. On the x-axis, we've got the collection date. And then in 2022, over three tests, average telomere length was 7.05 kilobases. But remember, youth, average values in youth are closer to 7.75 kilobases. So I've, at least based on 2022 data, I had a long way to go to get telomere length back towards youthful values. And technically, this is one of the weak spots in my data as 7.05 kilobases is pretty close to age expected. And the goal is to have youthful biomarkers, not age expected biomarkers. All right, what about in 2023? So uh, three tests over the span of a year may not be, or at least I think it may not be representative of a full year average. So in 2023, I tested eight times. And over those eight tests, average telomere length was better at 7.13 kilobases. Now, whether that I actually increased telomere length or that's a closer representation of the year full year average, I'm, I'm not sure, but nonetheless, it moved in the right direction, closer to that youthful value of 7.75 kilobases. All right, so what about in 2024? So for the most recent test, we can see that it was my best ever data for telomere length, 7.24 kilobases. And this is a low probability event as telomere length declines during aging. And when considering where I started in 2022, this is an unlikely event to see 7.24 kilobases. So then even with that 7.24 kilobase value being my best ever, the average in 2024 is still exactly at the same as 2023 data. So granted, while that's a small win, it hasn't declined. Uh, but note that it, it isn't better. And that's because three of the last six tests were on the low side or the lower side of my telomere length range. So when considering that variability, this raises a few questions. First, can I repeat the 7.24 kilobase value for telomere length? And then what may have caused the big jump from 7.07 to 7.24, or what may have caused the big jump in seeing my best ever data for telomere length? And to address that, which factors are significantly correlated with telomere length? So let's go through the approach on how I'm able to look at correlations for diet even or even supplements or any, any variable with blood test biomarkers. So since 2015, I've weighed all of my food using a food scale. And then I enter those daily food amounts into Chronometer. And if you want to use Chronometer to track your own diet, there's a discount link in the video's description. And then I take Chronometer data and enter that into a spreadsheet. And I should mention, uh, we're working on building an app where you can just export Chronometer data and take your blood bi uh, biomarker data and upload that into our app. And you you sh you'll be able to calculate correlations on your own, uh, you know, so it won't just be me showing you data. We can all do this and use this approach uh, to see what may be impacting what in terms of diet impacting biomarkers. All right, so then each blood test has a corresponding average dietary intake. In other words, if, there are, if there's a 50-day period in between blood tests, the average dietary intake for those 50 days lines up with the latter blood test. And then knowing that each blood test has a an average dietary intake that lines up with it with enough blood tests and enough track dietary or supplement or fitness data, whatever variables you want to track, we can look at correlations.
So after every test, I calculate correlations for diet and many other variables with biomarkers, including telomere length. So for this test, I looked at 98 comparisons for telomere length with foods, macro, and micronutrients. And that's what we'll see here, 16 test correlations for telomere length versus diet. And note that this is nine variables. These nine variables are each statistically significant at a p-value less than 0.02. And this is only part of the list because there were 19 foods or nutrients that had a p-value less than 0.05, which is the general measure of statistical significance being less than 0.05 for the p-value. And if you're interested in seeing the full list, that's on the correlations tier on Patreon. All right, so in terms of the correlation, that's the lowercase r. And then atop the list, we can see that cloves uh, are positively correlated, significantly positively correlated with a longer epigenetic estimation of telomere length. So note that this isn't a crazy amount of cloves. This is an average of, at most, 0.4 grams per day. So I'm not weighing out 0.4 grams per day. Two or three days per week, I mix two grams of cloves in with other stuff, flaxseed states, et cetera, to get to that relatively high end of my intake range of 0.4 grams per day. So what that positive correlation suggests of 0.076 is that during dietary periods where I've eaten more cloves or cloves higher towards the higher end of my intake range, intake range of 0.4 grams per day, that's significantly correlated with a longer epigenetic estimation of telomere length. In contrast, though, saturated fatty acids, SFAs, are inversely correlated with telomere length. In other words, when my saturated fatty acid intake is relatively towards the high end of my range, that's significantly correlated with a shorter telomere length. So saturated fatty acids coming from what? Interestingly, they are also on this list because the majority of my SFAs come from two foods, coconut butter and cacao beans which are also inversely correlated with telomere length. So when I've had relatively higher intakes of those foods, telomere length has been shorter. Note that copper may also be a part of that story as the majority of my copper intake comes from cacao beans, but also from mushrooms, which didn't make the top nine on this list. Also on the list, oh, before we go to more on the list, if you wanna see how this compares to the 15 test correlations uh, I posted that in an earlier video, which will be in the right corner, and I'll have more on that story in a minute. Also on the list is potassium. So when potassium is relatively higher, towards the higher end of my range, telomere length has been shorter. And note that that's my, my average range for potassium intake is can be very high, as much as 10,000 milligrams per day. So this suggests somewhere around more recent intake, around 6,500 milligrams per day may be optimal, at least based on correlations with telomere length. And then there are three other foods on this top nine list, selenium, sardines, and calcium, each of which I purposefully intake, uh, increased from test number 15 to test number 16. For selenium, I did that for the thyroid hormone experiment, trying to increase the free T3 to free T4 ratio, which didn't work. But that selenium is on this list suggests that a relatively higher selenium intake may be good for the epigenetic estimation of telomere length. And then I also increased sardines to test their uh, plus six net correlative score with a panel of about 25 biomarkers. The majority of the other biomarkers with the exception of blood urine nitrogen and uric acid didn't change. Phenoage age was the same, but these data suggest that I may wanna keep sardines towards the higher end of my range, at least for the next test or the test after that. So what do I do with all of this information once I've calculated the correlations? Well, with the goal of optimizing telomere length, but also any biomarker that I'm tracking, the goal is to follow as many of the correlations as possible. So this isn't just follow cloves. It's how many of these foods or nutrients do we need to impact a, a given biomarker? Each biomarker may be impacted by many different inputs, both, po both positively and negatively. And I don't know which ones or if any are causative. So the goal is to follow as many of the quote unquote significant using that arbitrary p-value threshold less than 0.05. So for test number 17, cloves will be relatively high or towards the higher end of my range, at least 0.4 grams per day. Saturated fatty acids will be on the lower end of my range. I've purposely limited cacao beans and coconut butter once again, although not as low as for the last test. So that may make an impact on the next telomere length data. We'll see. But then I've chosen not to follow the selenium, sardines, and calcium intake. Now, if telomere length isn't my best, again, at 7.24, but is higher than that 7.13 average, it would suggest that maybe cloves and saturated fatty acids are involved in mechanisms that impact the epigenetic estimation of telomere length. But if it's 
7.17, which is still on the high side of my data, it could suggest that adding selenium, sardines, and calcium or increasing them towards the higher end of my range may be needed to get towards 7.24 or higher. If that's the case, that will be the strategy if that's what the correlations show for test number 18. And then after each test, I recalculate the correlation. So as I just mentioned, the stuff that's at the top of the list, I'll continue to try, try to follow as many of those correlations as possible with the goal of optimizing that given biomarker, in this case being telomere length. The next test is scheduled for a week, around a week from today. So stay tuned for the, those data sometime in October. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while also helping to support the channel. And those include epigenetic, epigenetic testing, Ulta Labs, at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood, blood testing with SciFox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, di uh, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.